This podcast features someone who isn't Northern. What a rare occasion that is. <laughs> he might be able to understand some of it. Perfect um, time to strike. <laughs> perfect time to strike. You'll get that one, Jamie. I apologise that I wasn't there. Yeah, Matty couldn't make this one, could you? No. We was mightyless. Bastard. Um, but we met up with our friend Jamie, one half of Anive, who was touring throughout the UK and we bumped into him in Manchester. Um, so we thought we'd interview him and podcast with him in a car. Why not? Why the uh, fuck not? We've known Jamie for a while. Uh, you well, two longer than I have. But we will go through all of that and explain everything. Yeah, we'll uh, go in depth on it, but it's a good little chat. To it's a about good one. Anive, what they've been through, uh, what's happening now with them. Music industry, in general, yeah. yeah. Industry in general. Um, I really enjoyed this one. I really enjoyed fun. this one. It was good fun. Uh, and Jamie will definitely be back to do another podcast. For sure, yeah. We'll, we'll make sure. For sure. For sure. <laughs> Even <laughs> Matty will be there. Yeah. But Maybe. Evil Matty. <laughs> Steve. 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 I don't know, unless we're, unless we're session. Like, you want for a sesh, Jamie? <laughs> <laughs> Drunk cast. Yeah, yeah. Drunk cast. Drunk cast. <laughs> Quick reminder, whilst we're on here, uh, Oxbloods have a show at the Tudor on July 20th. Uh, it is free. In good old Wigwam. In good Wigwam. old Wigan. We'll be there. We'll be there. It is Chris's last show with us. Um, so we'd hope and like a decent turnout for it to send him off in style. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's it. It's episode 10. Go follow us on social media. Let us know what you think. Make sure you check out Oxblood's gig in Wigan. And Anive. And Anive. And Anive and and new album very soon from them. Very soon. An album which I don't know who they were touring with, the La Fontaines. The new album is sick. Definitely worth listening to if you haven't already. You've probably heard some of their songs anyway. But if not, check them out. Uh, Episode 10, enjoy. Enjoy. So ready. So, so ready. fucking ready. ready. There we go. So I swear, ready. I'm mad to swear. Gosh, Sick. I thought you listened to our podcast or you're trying to say. I couldn't quite remember. Fucking lies again. <laughs> it's like my egg all over. I know. <laughs> Still not watched episode two. What uh, happened, Yeah. yeah. Why well, doesn't listen to our podcast? <laughs> what a fucking <laughs> record. Just like you, apparently. I fucking, hey, I, I listen. I just, I, I'm sorry I didn't keep a swear count. Sorry. See how it is. Uh, yeah. So, we have finally got Mr. Jamie Finch on the podcast. Alright. How do you mate? Alright. Right. How's it going? Yeah, it's been a while. Right. Yeah. Are we recording now? Yeah. Shit. Look at that. Look at that. It's Everything happening. Everything you say now. It's happening. It's on the record. record. Oh, shit. It's happening. It's happening. <laughs> alright. Cool. Don't ask me any personal questions, alright? Uh, <laughs> I didn't sign up for that. I was trying to think of some personal questions <laughs> that went out <laughs> What's your favourite kind of cloud? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of your... personal questions do you think I asked? <laughs> So, oh. you were on tour at the minute. Yes. Um, how's it with? gone? I'm on tour with the LaFontaines, who are a sick Scottish like rap rock band. Um, which is quite weird, because it's like a nice full circle, especially seeing as we're in Manchester now, um, because we were signed to the same label that was based in Manchester like a long, long time ago as the LaFontaines. Oh, and that right. was really weird, yeah. So, it's... And then we then that's happened, and then, you know, we went... We, we, we both left and went to separate wherever other labels and now we're back on the same label again which oh, is why nice. we're on this tour with them yeah. yeah so it feels kind of quite nice big old big old circle and now i'm in manchester in a weird car talking about them <laughs> um yeah it was yeah it's all right we just played it was good that was um was manchester good this time yeah yeah i had a I, bad experience last time yeah i manchester's always one of my favorite places to play and visit actually i really like i really like the, the city um but last time we played here we had a few technical difficulties and it was just a bit rubbish and it was it was for a crowd that weren't really into us and wow. um so that was that kind of i was i had a bad taste in my mouth about manchester but tonight <laughs> tonight's fixed it so that's good tonight was great it was really fun it's because weird. you saw us or just the gig because you, oh, yeah, you guys showed up i was yeah, like oh yeah, yeah totally it's just sick now yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but yeah it's weird when you play a show when you're supporting someone that's definitely not going to suit like the genre you are yeah. it's like, and oh, that you're it's a like, female fronted band here's a metalcore band <laughs> 
thanks. Yeah. Like we had that, I was like, fuck, we're really Marmite here right now. Yeah. And then like oh, everyone's at, like who's like gone to review the show, you're expecting some type of genre band to be there. Yeah. And then they're like, Oh no, you're completely different. You're like mm. indie. You're like, we're not fucking indie. <laughs> <laughs> you're indie. That's a big label. That, that's to give that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We get we we get pop punk. If someone says we're pop punk, Ooh. I'm like Ooh. fuck you. Yeah, that stings. That's not my that's my thing. No, yeah, it. it's weird. Female fronted bands are so weird. Like, uh, it's probably worth mentioning. I'm in one. <laughs> Anave, and I'm in Anave, and that's a that's a female fronted band. It's, How long has Anave been going? Oh, it's mate, too while, long. It? Too long. Long. A long time. Oh, yeah. yeah, a long time. Probably like eight years. Um, I think I started like following you guys like when it was about you were about a year in. Really. Because it that's was exit stage left. You had yeah. out at that point and wasn't that's old. That. That's yeah. old. This that's is something old I don't know because I met you, Jamie, uh, when we were <laughs> co-writing for Trapped in Home yeah, yeah. doing Lungs. Yeah. How did you and Lund meet? How did that happen? Uh, I remember this. Yeah. Go on. Because I remember I was like really into your band like, <laughs> into anime at that point I was like fuck right I'm now motivated to make my own female fronted band <laughs> <laughs> I was like right we'll do it like that and then um, the, the best Were the you... best bands start by stealing ideas yeah. it's cool, yeah. it's cool. It's perfect idea <laughs> it's like fuck I'm motivated I'll make another band um, <laughs> and then we was we released a cover on YouTube uh, but you'd already been aware of Liv on YouTube. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'd booked in to record at another studio, <laughs> and you was like, I'm going to pitch to you why you should record with me and cancel your recording session yeah. and come to Whitstable and everything else. And yeah, I remember now, actually. Yeah, so I, yeah, I saw one of Liv's covers. Uh, I can't remember what song it was, but I was like, this is sick. Like She's she's really got something. She's got something there. She just needs to kind of like, I don't know. Hone it. Hone it, yeah. Harness it a bit. And, um and I was co-writing for people at that point, and I, I reached out to her, and she was up for it, and then you guys were up for it, and then, yeah, we, we made some bloody music, didn't we? We did make some music. Yeah, it was all right, wasn't it? It was decent. That was fun. Right. It's a good time. It's probably one of the best, like, recording experience, band experiences, like, I've ever had, just in terms of, like, of how the, the actual, like, atmosphere was whilst mm. recording. Because, like, now I kind of realise, like, how important that is, like, to be in the right environment, and oh, then yeah. after, you're kind of still in the zone of being a band, and it's not, like... Oh, I have to walk the dog later, and nah. what am I doing for tea? Oh. <laughs> yeah, we kind of lived in it, didn't we? Yeah. Like, um Because we, the first, was it an EP? The first EP, we, first we EP. like, lived in the studio. Yeah. Um, and, like, so we sort of... Which was an experience. Yeah, so, and I think that's good at some time, like, to kind of live and breathe the yeah. record that you're working on, and we kind of, yeah, um, that... That helped, and then the second EP we did in like a caravan yeah, down. We lived in a caravan, caravan down the road from, from the studio. That was sick. <laughs> was sick. Yeah, that was really good. That was my. They were my favorite, probably my favorite co-writes I'd ever done because it was just very like. Uh, <laughs> it was just very like. Sat right in. Hey, no, I'm <laughs> trying. Right. I'm counting all the traps in Norton co-writes. Okay, right. Don't worry. <laughs> um, yeah, no, they 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 were my favorite because like. I don't know. It just felt like we were all very much aware of where we were going, and there wasn't yeah, yeah. there wasn't much resistance. Like co-writing is quite a. For anyone who doesn't know, co-writing is basically when someone, either usually a label sends you to a co-writer, or yeah. sometimes on the rare occasion a co-writer approaches a band, um, and they basically all they're basically saying is your songs are good, but I can make them better if you do them the way I say. <laughs> yeah. And it's a really horrible thing to do. Um, but you guys are always totally like, yeah, cool, let's try all these things and you know see if it works. And I if it doesn't, we're all pretty. To it for doing that stuff, yeah. though. Like, I mean, definitely. It's like from me trying it afterwards, like. It's definitely a hard thing for people to kind of take on board. I think yeah. we've all wrote songs ourselves, and yeah. you only can all get to a point, and then you're like, "There's nothing else I can do until you have someone else's fresh yeah. perspective yeah. on it." Yeah, and that's sometimes sometimes people see it as a negative thing, as like needing not even needing someone, but like wanting someone else's ears on it, and that's so valuable. Like, I mean, I sent you guys the album, right? We just finished our album. I sent yeah. you guys to hear it for mixing because you just need to hear people from on the outside need to hear what you're doing because yeah. you, you're so in it you're hearing a completely different song to them um, and you've got completely different ideas and you definitely need like an outsider perspective to jump to just jump in and be like cool this song's good this one's rubbish let's make that better like whatever um, yeah and obviously as you can imagine that's quite hard for a lot of bands to take yeah um, but yeah you guys took it in your stride and I think I think the the music really benefited from it yeah I I'm think, really proud of those EPs yeah I'll, and the single the nice. Lungs yeah, yeah. I think version two and version one was two completely different like 
vibes because it was at different times because like when we started when we did lungs it was a very like much like right we need to get hit the ground running we need to kind of like fix obviously like because we released the second ep and mm. then we had all that band politics and then it kind of you replaced the singer yeah yeah and which, is, it, which is always hard for any band it was like, singer it's and compl- drummer in one go and so. yeah yeah but the singer's like uh the face to everyone on the outside yeah isn't it? and it can completely change yeah that's that's I mean, it's like we changed that because that was from october to december that mm. changed round mm. which is quite quick turnaround in terms of like right let's just completely rebrand the band but you are right because um when we went and did it uh you do live and breathe that studio mm-hmm. and yeah it's, it's i think that's nice better though i think you need that separation from it though because if it, the thing that i've learned recently from doing like oxblood stuff like it's kind of not the same vibe not like the right vibe but it's a completely different vibe doing it where you go home afterwards and you're mm. not living and breathing it, and you don't have your full focus on it because you don't have everyone's full attention on what yeah. you're trying to achieve. Yeah, definitely. So, what do you do? You still do co-writing, or I do a bit. Yeah, most of the time now it's it's synth work. I do a lot of synths oh, cool. for people. Um, so less co-writing, more kind of I don't know. I guess you. I guess it's sessioning. I don't really know what the word is, but yeah, I do synths for people, um, which is interesting. 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 I told it, I can't say anything else because I'm working on some stuff now. Which, oh, okay. yeah, but uh, yeah, it's sometimes it can be tricky. Is it like specific synths or just like whatever you? Uh, want well, that's the weird thing about it with synths. It's like synths is such a broad term. Yeah, because I just passed you on. And you're like, cool. Yeah. Um, but then there's others, and you're like, oh, I know exactly what yeah. this is. And yeah, exactly. And to me, synths is like. It's basically any electronic thing, and yeah. that I in, in that le- I electronic created sound. Yeah, exactly, and I include like cut up vocal samples and yeah, yeah, you know, cool. bass lines that are just you know they're not playing on the bass. They're just a simple. I don't know. It's simple is so broad. So when you get hired and someone says I want you to do synth for me, it's normally such a massive brief. And for example, I had a brief recently that was like you know do just do synths for the whole album, and I was like, what are the references? And they they referenced Anave and the stuff I do. I was like, all right, cool. So I did like a lot of bass synth, which is all over our stuff, and a bit of like high end kind of side chainy white noise stuff. Um, but what they actually wanted was all the cut up vocal stuff. And uh, most of the time, you can't just crowbar that in. Like sometimes you can. God knows I try a lot of the time. Um, but uh, sometimes, like, this, you know, most of the time, the song has to be written around that sort of stuff. Um, so people think that they sort of hire someone to do synths, and that'll happen. Uh, so it can be a bit, it can be a bit interesting, but it normally works out. Um, but yeah, I think simps are such a. If you don't, if you've never stepped into the world of simps, you it's such an unknown. Yeah, that's how I feel. Yeah, <laughs> whereas you know, like your way around, you you yeah. know more than I do about simps. So like, you know, you've yeah, got a better so idea of. It's like if you talk about synthesis, then it's an endless ones like mm. subtractive wavetable FM. And that's all how different algorithms yeah, interact yeah. with different Big sounds. words. Big, yeah, big don't words. I sound intelligent? <laughs> <laughs> I'm dumb as fuck. <laughs> we have degrees. <laughs> <laughs> time to use it. <laughs> the only time I'll use it. But, uh, <laughs> I'm a podcast. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> what a mate. <laughs> I'm getting somewhere in life. Like, <laughs> worth yeah, every penny. <laughs> worth I'm it. I'm so alone. <laughs> 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 um, but how's uh, Ryan been for Anive lately? And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh mate, I for Anive, fair idea. Talk us that's through a, the yeah. past few years. That's a chunk of a question. Yeah, that's I a gave big old so question. I'm gonna, down. I'm gonna properly tell the short version because, as you know, I've, I've told you, I've, I've ranted to you many a time, London, about this whole scenario. Yeah. The short version is, um, we got signed by a big American label uh, a few years ago, um, and it looked great. You know, they seemed to have everything we wanted, and they had loads of massive, massive bands on there. Um, our friends had signed at the same time um so it seemed great it was all perfect and we signed up to them as long story short they ended up um not really knowing what to do with us and they shelved us um oh, so yeah i guess anyone doesn't know shelving basically means when when a, when a label sign you they own you and they want to if for them to release music it's going to cost them a bit of money to do that um you know recording costs and videos yeah. and marketing and all that stuff and if they don't think you're worth the money that you know you, they're going to spend on um releasing you they just won't yeah because if they can't recoup that investment they won't yeah. see it as a worth that's title. insane though that insert going oh we will, yeah. we'll sign you but we won't use you yeah yeah it's the worst shelved is the best yeah. is, is the word for it but like yeah it's, it's just like we own you um and we're gonna, we're gonna stop you doing anything um we're not gonna let you leave 
because you know Jesus. you're still an asset to us like you still co- you know, you're still worth some money so we're not gonna you. Yeah. so yeah that went on for a few years and it was horrible like basically but the thing is they never actually say that which is the worst thing they never say that to you they never say you know we're not gonna release any music they say keep writing this, <laughs> these songs aren't good oh. enough just keep writing and we would, we went they sent us to like la to write a bunch of songs with a load of pop people like big time pop people and it was rubbish because we it just wasn't the right environment for us and you know we, we didn't really click with them and the label were telling them to make us sound a certain way and then we went into the sessions trying to sound a different way some sessions the label didn't even send our songs to them so they didn't even know who we were what we sounded like so they had no idea what the session was what the fuck? yeah it was crazy um and how, how did that feel creatively creatively yeah creatively yeah um, um I'm, like because obviously you didn't know you were shelved at the time. Yeah. And then you're being sent to all these places. So to me, it'd be like a kid in a candy store sort mm. of thing of like, I've got all this toys, all this... Uh... Yeah. Well, yeah. It was yeah. It was nice. Yeah. I but we never wanted to go. We, we were basically made to go. Our manager at the time said, just go to California and like do what they say. Just make it look good like okay. just, just, yeah um Get along just with just the label. Yeah, yeah make friends and you know this might maybe they'll let you have a bit of creative whatever um and we did and we wrote like 20 songs while we we're out there none of them will ever get released except one which is on the album it closes the album it's probably the most important song we've ever written because it was the first it was the only co-write session we had out there where the guy sean bow is his name literally just instead of going I'm going to play some stuff and you're going to write over it like riff and improvise which we don't do like yeah. me and Becca write in our room separately like me and Becca haven't written in the same room for like six years um, we don't do it in the same room uh, and he was he just sat us down and was like so tell me your story and we spoke for two hours about how well basically exactly what I've just told you how we don't want to be there and you know whatever and then we wrote a song called California which is yeah, the, the lyrics are I don't want to go to California <laughs> the whole thing's like that and that's the only song that came out of that session um yeah, and uh, basically we, when we gave those songs to the label afterwards, we were happy with them at the time. They called us up and were like really harsh, like these are shit, you're terrible, what are you doing? Like what's wrong? You need to do wow. this, you need to do better and all this shit. Um, and I didn't write a song for about a year. I just stopped writing. Um, I just lost everything. Becca started writing really weird stuff, you know, because she, she likes that. She goes to weird places sometimes when she writes, but it was like nothing that would be, you know, viable for them. Or, or, not yeah, Anna yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe. We, we get pretty weird on the album now because we let ourselves to be, but like it was nothing that was going to help the situation. Um, and I just gave up altogether. And then we met with a few people. Long story short, they said, you know, just tell them to drop you. Just ask them to drop you. Like, just do it. Um, they had broken the contract on a few different points because there's like, there's like clauses that say, you know, once you've delivered some music, they have to release it within a certain time period. And they had held on to our EP, Are You Dreaming, for like a year, I think, before oh. releasing it. So, yeah, blah, 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 we said, can you drop us? And they were like, cool, you're dropped. And we were like, sick. So we did a pledge music campaign, which we really didn't want to do. It's like a crowdfunding thing. Yeah, yeah. And we really don't like that. We don't like the idea of asking fans for money and stuff. It really freaks us out. Like, that's why our merch is so cheap, because we hate the idea of people spending loads of money on our merch. Um, and we put the target at, like, a, an amount that would be enough for us to record two songs. Right. And we quadrupled that target. Like, we wow. absolutely smashed it, because everyone was just like, you guys have been, have been gone for so long and now you're back take all my money like they were so happy to give us their money and it was the best feeling ever 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 and the second we did that I started writing again um, and then suddenly we were just like writing the best stuff we've ever written um, and was really happy with it <clears throat> and then do I go into the pledge stuff the pledge yeah. music stuff yeah do it man so pledge music basically all these like um so all our, all our fans like paid to this campaign we sent out a load of merch to them uh really cool stuff like personalized stuff like merch and um props and music videos notes, wasn't there? handwritten and like lyric I sheets said, i remember seeing becca do that yeah she wrote like 100 of them out and got like wrist cramp it was pretty bad um <laughs> but that was really cool like it was it was the coolest thing because it felt like we were finally connected with our fans when there'd been this fucking wall of a label that was yeah. just stopping us from doing anything um that was amazing and then basically pledge music would just not pay us they were like yeah we'll pay you like next month you know we've got a bit of a backlog of payments we'll pay you next month and then next month and then next month and then six months later we found out that they went bankrupt and filed for what is it bankruptcy, bankruptcy. yeah bankruptcy. <laughs> <laughs> funny that um so uh yeah so pledge music um filed for bankruptcy and then 
you know announced that they weren't paying any of their any of the artists the fans money that they were holding on to so basically they had a big pot that everyone's every fan's money went to that they held on to until they gave it to the band at the end of the campaign and they just fucking spent it i guess i don't know what happened but yeah cunts uh <laughs> and um yeah so we got told that we were not going to get most of the money from the campaign which was not as heartbreaking as i thought it would be i th- would kind of i was kind of like I didn't care that much because I think, and I genuinely, this sounds like, you know, bullshit people say, you know, about fans and all that shit, but I genuinely, like, none of the money matters. It was the fact that all of our fans were like, we're with you, we're standing behind you, and we want to hear new music. That that empowered us way more than the amount of money that we raised would have done. Um, so by that point, we didn't really care, and we'd already signed to this label. We're now on um, Wolf at Your Door Records, um, and we got the album sorted through them they helped us out and they're still helping us out now and yeah so pledge music accounts but it's fine it doesn't <laughs> actually change anything so did the fans get the i'm guessing refund or no so well they wow. got all the merch <laughs> yeah no they got all the merch yeah yeah so um, you fulfilled that part didn't you yeah well we we fulfilled it you're supposed to wait until the money comes through and then do that but we were like we're not going to if Pledge are being slow to pay everyone we're not yeah, going to make yeah. our fans wait so we sent all the merch out thinking it's fine we'll get the money back and you know we won't lose money on this and I think we've actually ended up losing money on the campaign Jesus. because we sent out so many t-shirts and you know mugs and whatever yeah. else we sold but again we don't care we literally don't care like it was because you got that uh, sort of support from the fans that made you realise oh this is why I do it in the yeah. first place and... 100% 100% I literally while, while we were going back a bit while we were shelved by that label um, I used to have like go just have a scroll through like youtube comments and stuff and you'd see comments from people that like totally understood what we were going through like they were commenting on old videos saying like it's so shit that label was stopping this band from releasing new music web and i screenshot all of them i had a little folder on my computer of like really? like 50 comments from people like that and when i was feeling shit about it i'd go through and like nice. just remind myself that there are people fucking listening and there are people waiting and pledge music the campaign was the biggest kind of we're still waiting and we're still ready to hear music and it was like the most empowering thing ever and then we the first thing we did when we were unsigned is fucking went to the studio recorded a song called Afraid and it got 2 million hits on Spotify so that was a big like fuck you to label because like, they heard that song and said it was shit and we were like well we'll release <laughs> ourselves and you know did you gotta like realise people in labels they don't know music <laughs> no. all they know is this is Figures. an investment I have to distribute it to a certain demographic and yeah. so on to try and recoup it so they're not interested in what music is good or bad yeah yeah, yeah. And you, you mentioned no this judgment. on your podcast before as well, like quite early on, you said that, you know, when you start a band, you think, oh, we want to get signed and we want to do this, we want to get a record label and stuff like that. Um, and considering we've had three record labels now, yeah. three record deals, um, it's very clear to me that they don't do that much. Like they fund stuff, which is amazing. You know, they give you a lot of funding and they give you a lot of know-how. And like our first record label, Lab Records, they sent us in with a co-writer, which taught me how to like you know refined yeah. songs and um stuff like that like they do cool stuff like that but no band needs a label at all um and you can do so much unsigned yeah um so- and any label that pops up while you're not doing basically any label that pops up while you're not making enough money to like fund yourself they're probably not supposed to be there like they're probably i don't know i think it suggests that they don't know what they're talking about like labels yeah. should be interested when you're already making money because they want to see you like you, you should be an easy bet for them yeah um and the good labels will help develop you and you know make you better um yeah so so what's the benefit for you still being signed to this label because right now there's nothing stopping you from staying unsigned and doing yeah. well with your fans yeah so we we um when we met when we met with this label they, they you know they said they're interested they want to meet up and whatever we, we went for a chat with them but we basically said we're not interested in signing at all because of the last label we, yeah they your screwed attitude us over. from yeah. the last one I was like I, no offence so super happy that you're interested in us like we like a lot of their band they got Def Havano big fans of Def Havano Acres and 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 Acres yeah great bands on our label and we're like that's cool but we're never going to sign a label again because of these like six reasons and they were like cool no worries and then it, that was before Christmas and then in January they came back with an offer that had none of those things in like, basically everything we said that we thought was shit they just sort of fixed them so we were like oh we kind of have to sign now so <laughs> um, so we did and the, the main reason we did it was because um, we thought that 
like Afraid uh, which had gone out unsigned like on our own and Are You Dreaming which went out on the previous label but like with no marketing behind it that went to our fans and our fans liked it and they engaged with it and they, yeah, they yeah. let us know they liked it and that was great um, and we loved that and we knew that if we did an album which has to, we've been putting off doing an album for so long we had to do an album next we knew that if we did it on our own it would go to our fans again which is great and they love it but it wouldn't reach out any further yeah. So we're like, let's give it one push. Like, let's let's get involved with someone. And this label are really excited, you know, to work with us. And you know, some of the people that work there are cool, uh, and um, they are going to help us push it to more people. So that's for us is the is the big benefit. But again, I think that's like quite a it's quite a long way down the line kind of thing. Like once we've done a couple of releases and built a bit of a following then I think labels make sense because they're going to kick you to the next level like yeah. the next step yeah, up yeah. which is what Lab Records did to us Lab Records took us when we were doing okay in our own little sort of YouTube bubble online and then brought us to the next level Yeah, that's what labels should do um, and that's why I think bands should stop worrying about labels super early on yeah. like it's so not important you need to just like just do something good first like yeah. do, do you support yourself it always reminds me of like um we all know the single guy who just wants a girlfriend and just needs yeah. a girlfriend. The more he thinks and fixates on having a girlfriend, he'll never get a girlfriend. Mm. But as soon as he focuses on himself, all of a sudden these girls are popping yeah. up. And it's exactly the same with the music. If you focus on the music first, make that good. Yeah. It's going to come, isn't 100%, it? 100%, man. Hundred percent. Like I've always kind of joked about it. Like I think if people spent the, t- the time people s- like new bands spend on like emailing A&R and labels and googling who's on what label and all that stuff if they spend that time writing songs they'd probably write some songs that are good enough that a label will pick up eventually yeah. like bands fixate on stuff like that so much and I definitely did it in the start as well like, I worried about you know who was going to be at shows and what industry are going to turn up and if we can impress some label or whatever but once you just stop and just write good songs do you know what I mean it just management's hours at the minute yeah, that's ours. We're kind of like, fuck. We need a manager because we can't. We only get to a point where it's then like, oh, I feel like we're speaking through a brick wall. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Like we were really stubborn last time. We were like, right, fuck it. We're doing our own PR. Like yeah. we're gonna do all of that. Yeah. But then it was kind of like, one. I think we kind of underestimated the amount of shit you have to do for PR. And then secondly, that if you don't have them contacts, this random guy from this random band emailing going, can you feature us or things like that is just a really like tall push. Yeah, yeah. I mean, probably not worth getting into now because I could talk about it for ages. But I fucking hate PR companies. Yeah, we've been with we've been with loads um, over the years and years and years. Uh, we've been <laughs> we've been with a few and the small guys like the smaller ones, the ones that are affordable basically to bands like us. Um, they just chuck you on a fucking mailing list and don't really have that much swing. Like they're just no. they're just telling their mates about you, which is fine. But like, it, it's not worth the investment no, you're no. putting into a PR company. No, 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 and they cost so much. Like for for what they do, it's crazy. I think they're bollocks. Like and, until you get like a proper big PR company where people actually care about what they're saying, until you get that, it's not worth doing it. No, and I'm very against it. And with managers as well, um, managers are a weird one because we've had like all the like not all of them but like a good handful of the best managers in the UK work with us and it's lasted like months and they've just gone because they've realised it's quite a lot of work <laughs> like we're yeah. quite a hard sell for the most part um, but I think that you know the manager we've got now Dan he he jumped on when there was no money and we were shelved by the label and like we were fucked like we were in a really bad place and he jumped on and he slowly like dragged us out of that hole brushed us off like we, we we got dropped from the label and then he was like right go to the rehearsal studio and make your live show sick like he just proper like really sorted us out and got nothing for it like pennies yeah and then when we signed the new deal he got like a very 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 small cut for his trouble but he puts in so much time and effort and it's that you need people that are passionate and passionate when there's not going to be a great return yeah yeah. Because then his interest is completely in you, and yeah. it's not in I can make money out of these. Hundred percent, yeah. Because when when we were hyping, like when we were doing all right and making quite a lot of money, that's when the big time managers started taking interest. Yeah, then we course. were like, cool, let's work together. And then once they realise, oh, these, you know, there's there's a lot of work to get these guys to the next level, then they drop off. Um, yeah. But we've got someone like Dan. He's there because he cares about it, and he know, he knows we can be good. And like he's our he's our biggest like hype man. Like he always sort of sorts us out, and he's been through everything with us. Um, so that's again another thing I'm against management companies because um, I don't think they're really into it you know as much I think independent managers in my experience are always better like yeah. guys that are just on their own and just want to work in music like yeah so 
Sorry. That's me. That's me <laughs> damning. No, it's fine. No, no, for no long. of course. Yeah. No, I, was no. trying to be, I was trying to make it a positive thing. But, um, yeah. You but fuck later, pledge but music so far. Pl- fuck PR <laughs> companies and fuck yeah. management. Yeah. Fuck 11.7. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. We said <laughs> There it is. Uh, it's the, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I just, I just think, like, you guys mentioned it already. I'm just, I'm just kind of repeating what you've said anyway. But, um, I think bands fixate on things like labels and you know the higher industry side of things before they've even really become a band yeah like you gotta write a good 50 songs before you write one decent yeah. one and then and you know throw in the fact that no one really knows what their sound is when they first start being a band yeah all this stuff like you need to properly just forget that shit and just be good first because once you're good this this shit happens to you like it just yeah. it just, yeah, just it just shows up it just knocks on your door because you're good and you're doing stuff like and it's real to you and you know people can people can see the What's the word? Like sincerity, I guess, in music. Yeah. Um, you can you can spot a band a mile off that are trying to be like, you know, they're trying to look more polished than they are. Yeah, yeah. You can spot that a mile off. So, yeah. Smell anyway. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, that's just me being really cynical. Anyway, ask me some happy questions. That's, that's true, you, though. That's you, it's true, but it's you in general, anyway. We're used to this. Like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm pretty jaded by all this shit now. <laughs> it's Absolutely just adding to you. Yeah. yeah. So, um... Tour so far, how was? What's tour. the best show you've had so far? Uh, on this tour? So the La Fontaines are from uh, they're from Glasgow, and we played two nights in Glasgow, which is pretty cool. I love it when you do two nights in one city. I don't know why it's just quite cool. Um, and the first night was in a church. Oh nice! I saw pictures. Church. Looked yeah, insane. That was sick. Like we turned out, and the venue was called St Luke's Church, and I was like, oh, it's probably just a venue called that. And it's <laughs> no, it's a legit church. Like it's a fucking church. Like you're in, you're in like the priest's quarters, as like backstage, and like no the stage has stained glass windows behind it, and there's still like there's like prayer things written on the wall and shit. That was sick. It's, it's cool to see them using a church for something useful in 2019, like, <laughs> rather than <laughs> fucking religion. Yeah, exactly. Fucking waste of time. Uh, so yeah, I really wish we played anti faith for that show. <laughs> We've got like an anti religion song. We don't we don't play it anymore. That would have been quite cool to play. But yeah, that was sick because um, that was like I think it was like 500, 600 people, um, and because it's Glasgow, they're all going fucking mental Middle for that. Yeah. yeah, so good. That was really fun. So what do you play in terms of like? Obviously, you've got quite. a good collection of songs though what would you do you play anything from the old material like pre are you dreaming or we don't know uh mainly because our setup now we're a fee- we're a free piece so we've got a drummer i'm on guitar simps triggering uh and an extra drum and becca's on obviously vocals and she plays a drum as well so the old stuff is very like two guitar orientated yeah, like, yeah. There's, there's big lead parts that need chords on them and stuff and i think to play that with like a backing track guitar it's pretty weird we already have a few guitars on backing track and I play lead over them and it, it kind of feels strange yeah um, the newer stuff is much more I, accidentally it's more built for that setup, like the three piece setup. like I'm less about you know big fucking delay leads now I'm more about just just a fat chord or a riff or something like yeah um, so we play a lot of the new stuff now it's like three songs from Are You Dreaming and three off the album I think yeah um, which is cool we played this, we played some album songs on this tour for the first time ever and that's been terrifying um, what's the reaction Ben? yeah it was one of them a song called Human has been getting a really good reaction it's crazy like people are singing it by the time they get to the second chorus which is that's good amazing that's good. like I, I can't believe it um that's been brilliant and that's something about that song clicks like because obviously when you're on a support tour like this especially with a band like the La Fontaines they're so like they've got their sound and they've got their vibe and their fans are into that um, they don't necessarily like us like you know they're, they're, we're not their kind of thing like a girl weird a girl singer with a weird like synthy rock band behind her is, is, is kind of weird so we're a bit hit and miss with these guys but when we play Human um, they seem to really like connect like something happens so that's cool because that's on the album yeah. and it's like you know makes it it's less going terrifying. down yeah. well for yeah. people who are there to see yeah it's main going down. act so for you yeah for sure uh, you know and we're playing another album song which is which is dying on its ass every night so that's good to know as well <laughs> everyone seems kind of bored when they play that one when we play that one so yeah you know it's good to it's good to try well, to stuff at least you know it's like varied though mm. In terms of that, obviously, you're in a female-fronted band. Yeah. We used to be in a female-fronted band. Do you think that the overall reaction to, like, a female-fronted band has improved? 
because it was very much at a time it was kind of like you were kind of categorized in one specific area and then that oh, yeah, was pretty much it it was like it was a genre yeah like, oh Paramore yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. saying Great. the P word <laughs> <laughs> yeah we got that a lot we don't get that anymore but back in the day we got that a lot I think I think it's a combination of there being more female fronted bands out there doing cool stuff like you know uh, Yonaka Paris, in Paris. Nice. yeah, like they're female friendly bands, but they're not doing the Paramore thing. Yeah, that helps. Um, and I think there's just less bands that sound like Paramore now. Yeah, just, you know, even Paramore doesn't sound like Paramore anymore. Yeah, yeah. I think part of it is finding that sound as well. Yeah, um, we was absolute cons like at the start. We went, like, oh, we'll embrace the Paramore thing. Yeah. <laughs> Worst fucking idea yeah. ever. Like, and it was like, by the time we came to second EP, we were like, no, right, scrap it. We're yeah, not doing all that yeah, shit. Yeah. Like, it's hard. It's hard because like people kind of write you off in a sentence yeah and it feels bad because a lot of people used to say it's a compliment it's like oh you guys are really good you sound like Paramore and they'd be like oh yeah. feel <laughs> too good like it feels like I'm not doing anything cool but um, <laughs> it happens you know I don't know if the audience has changed or like or anything I think there's just less bands doing it like yeah you know back in the day every girl singer had like dyed hair and you know would do like pop punky stuff yeah yeah um, but I think, I know, I think that, gener- that, ge- that generation has kind of evolved a bit now yeah yeah, yeah us included sure. you know we're not very Paramore anymore um, well, I think yeah. that's the whole thing of being in the band. Like over time, you evolve as not only like musicians, Hopefully. but yes, yeah, you hope. <laughs> Fucking hope so. Yeah. <laughs> but you that's like, the goal. like as a band, you evolve. Like no, I've you... peaked right now. This is, it's all downhill <laughs> from here. You're the prime example of yourself right now. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. You're a sculpture in a museum, <laughs> <laughs> Matt. I've often, I've often thought that about you. I knew You're it. quite David. You, you know the fact that you even thought about me is good enough. <laughs> I'm going to be thinking about that tonight. Like, Jamie thinks about me. I'm so happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, <coughs> yes. <laughs> um, sorry, carry on with what you were. I completely no. That was the end of my part. But uh, with you saying your live setups changed. Mm. How's that been? Because yeah, you it's a transition for you. Um, it yeah. was it was scary because I never knew anything about like synths or backing tracks or Ableton or you know sampling or anything like that. Um, and I had to learn it all from scratch, which was a summer of pain. Like I, I missed <laughs> I missed the whole summer because I was inside like learning how Ableton works. Ableton is not very fucking friendly. It doesn't no, like new people using it, um, <laughs> but it's very powerful. So once you get your head around it, it does everything you want. Um, so that was the hardest part, uh, and we like so now we 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 have like seven. I don't know if this is interesting to people listening to this, but we have like seven outputs of of stuff. So we have like synth left right, guitar left right, bass effects, a few like quiet backing vocals and stuff. Um, and then I'm also like playing keys through it, and I'm sampling stuff, and we've got an SPDS hooked up to it, which is sampling stuff. Like it's all very like fucking brain in the Ableton oriented yeah. stuff. Um, which was terrifying at first because it was so much pressure on me and I had to fix it all and it was always breaking and I didn't know what was wrong half the time and yeah um, but now it feels so natural because obviously you know the, the band is just me and Becca um, and the drummer hooks in to Ableton and it all just kind of comes out the box like that um, and that's the song and it kind of feels right uh, so yeah it's, it was an interesting transition but it feels like the right one yeah, that's important. At least you are, are enjoying that and yeah, getting your head around Ableton even. Oh more. mate, it's horrible. I still don't. I still don't. <laughs> I touch don't. It. It's completely it's horrible. To uh, it. I hate Ableton. Man. I know at some point <laughs> I'm probably going to have to like understand it, but yeah. I think that's pretty much. It just seems right. backwards whenever you open it. It's, you, your whole arrangement window is right to left. It seems mm-hmm. like, and but the effects and the power of it, like you say, are fucking incredible. Yeah, once yeah. you once you figure so out people use it. Oh yeah, definitely. Once you figure out what you want it, like how to get it to do what you want it to do, it smashes it. Like it's so powerful yeah. and it can do so much. Yeah, it's just a, just a ball ache to learn, basically. Sure. But yeah, and now I've started doing that for other bands as well. There are, there are bands that are setting up their live their live stuff and they want to use Ableton. And I've started building their projects for them. Um, which is cool it, it's good because it helps me understand it better <laughs> um, I've done it so much now that after this tour I'm going to delete the Yanave project and start again just do it all from scratch because nice. I know how to do it better now oh, shit. Um, but yeah so it, it was a weird transition though because like obviously there's, there's just me basically there's drums and there's me playing an instrument on stage and you can hear so much coming through and so I, I was always conscious of that I don't, I don't want it to feel like we're kind of just putting loads of stuff through an iPod. And yeah, just hit and play. Yeah, but that's something that I think's changed recently as well. I remember when people used to complain about bands like Enter Shikari using it using a um, 
backing track. Yeah. And they'd be like, that's lame. And I'm like, but it's Enid Shakari. Like, their sound's so fucking complicated. Like, what do you want? You want, like, seven synth players on stage with them? Like, it'd be weird. Like, you have to use backing track. four more members. And, uh... Yeah, exactly. And trust me, if we had the budget to play all, <laughs> to have guitarists play all the guitar parts and the bassist and all the synth parts, I would fucking do it. Like, in a heartbeat. That'd be sick. But we don't. No. Um, I have to do it on backing track. But yeah, look, I think that's another thing that's kind of evolved over the years is people are more okay with backing track now like basically every drummer's on a click nowadays and yeah. you everyone has at least like a they have at least like a beefy layer in backing track if not you know main parts and i saw um some bands at uh, all points east recently who had so much like vocal effects in their backing track and it sounded sick it sounded well good and it's like what do you want you know do you want it to be purely live or do you want it to sound good and i think music's music's shifting that way now because like back in the day you know you want you want to see a live band you want to see them fuck up and you want to see them not sound great because you want it to be like raw you don't like, want them to sound perfect yeah you want you don't want it to sound like cd but nowadays you have bands that are just so good and the backing tracks level of quality is so good that they you know they sound re- pretty close to yeah, the cd yeah. Um, one of my favorite bands, Architects, get criticised for sounding too good because they're they're too perfect. Like, yeah. they, they sound amazing. <laughs> it sounds just like the track. Um, for me, I love it because I just want to see that being done in person. But like, yeah, that's that's just a hilarious thing, you know. That they've yeah. they've nailed the live mix and you know back and track stuff, and they're all tired as hell so much that people are moaning about it now. Yeah, but yeah no, I think how could you criticise that though? It's a baffling concept. That's the thing is people still want to. Some people want to. You know, they want it to feel live and they want it to feel real and. They've caught that moment where someone's made a slight error but just gone with it anyway. Yeah. And no one else gets to see that except whoever's stood in front Which of that stage. Which is fair enough. That's live music, yeah. right? It's not for everyone. You know, some people... I like I like seeing stuff sounding great and, you know, I don't care how they get Me to too. it. But, yeah, anyway, that's right. just... How was uh, All Points East? It's great, yeah. Saw Architects. Saw Bring Me The Horizon. Saw uh, Vukovi. Sick. Look over, cool. Yeah, it was that was mad. I was playing with him last minute, mm. like it was just a strange thing. Mm. <laughs> it was just like, what? Well, I was at work, and then like around about like one o'clock the same day they were playing Manchester. It was just mm. like, oh, do you want this local spot? I was like, Where is it for? Oh, for COVID? Like, Shit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we got we had a last minute gig with him as well. They they told us like two days before. Jesus. <laughs> like, we, me and like, Marty yeah. got the <laughs> ten minutes before our set time because we came from like the practice room, got our shit, and sure. then got to the venue. Mm. Got on stage and was like, right, go. And then I was like, nice. Yeah, they're sick. They're good they're guys. Cool. Yeah, they're they're good, good guys. Band. Yeah. So, what's the plans for the rest of the year then, Anive wise? Uh, so, we're going to, once this tour's over, we're going to go back to the rehearsal studio and we're going to work on stuff because, yeah, we've got a few ideas for what we want to do. We run um, we run a lighting show through Ableton and we're going to do a bit more of that, make that a bit cooler. Cool. Try and get some more album songs in the set. Just make things sound a bit better. This yeah. tour's this tour we've gotten a lot better on this tour because we kind of I don't know, I think the cause the crowds have been quite engaged. It's been good to sort of gauge like how certain songs sit and like where they should go in the set and we're yeah. gonna we're gonna do something the bands always hate doing. We're gonna put the song that we've ended on for the last three years in the middle of the set and end <laughs> on a different song. Which is terrifying, but we're gonna try that. But it's like um, a test how good you actually are and they say that right yeah it was, it was Aerosmith that come up with that or was it it might be Rolling Stones I don't know some dad rock some, band yeah uh, they, <laughs> they always said that like after a few shows they would play their last song the first middle. and their wow. first song last so that you play it differently like you have to play it like more enthusiastically yeah to you know make it be an, a finisher of the set which I thought was, always thought was quite interesting so to me when I watch a live band what's important is the energy they bring on stage which is why I like Slipknot so much because yeah. they always have 100% energy yeah. it's always yeah, mental by at least one of them oh yeah um, so I think with you changing the order of the songs changes the energy of the show and mm. you've got well, that to makes make that it work. unique though because yeah, then you've course. got that variation like, it's not yeah. just the exact same set it's like yeah. fucking five times in a row but you've got that variation you've got that change so you've got that different reaction from a different crowd yeah definitely which is cool so before we end it yeah you're going to be coming back to Manchester I want to yeah with Anive or just yourself? Uh, both, mate. Both. I yeah. want to come back. Yeah, another tour soon. I, I've had like ten minutes of walking around today because like sound check and setup was mental. So I want to um, come back because I've realised that I like Manchester again. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll come back soon. But yeah, we've got a few ideas of tours being talked about. Um, we'll be back before the end of the year, I reckon. Got an album coming out, haven't we? We've got to fucking yeah. tour it. So what, what do you want to plug? Right now, before we uh, end uh, up, for all three of our listeners, go listen to Anive on Spotify, innit? 
There you go. Give me them sweet tenth of a penny per play. <laughs> you um, you going to do another podcast with us when you come back? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. I've got loads more I want to talk about. So okay, yeah. great. Come back, yeah. Min, but you've so. got to catch the end of a gig in oh, a minute. Laugh on Tames, yeah. 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 Go sell some merch. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Sweet. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me, mate.